Hey everyone, this is the GTX 970, the classic MSI gaming version. Astonishing performance for its time. It could beat the 780 Ti and overclock beyond stock 980 performance. What a card. And this, this is the GTX 1070, the reference version here. A bit pricier than its predecessor, but it delivered performance on par or better than the Titan X Maxwell. Now this is the legacy that the new RTX 2070 needs to live up to, but to what extent can it deliver? That's the question I'm answering today, or at least attempting to answer. You see, the problem with reviewing any RTX product in the here and now is exactly the same as it was when we looked at the 2080 and the 2080 Ti. There's a ton of new tech in these GPUs, but little to no software that uses them outside of some demos. So take ray tracing, for example. Now at the RTX launch event, we did actually get to see some early demos and games running on 2080 Ti hardware. So at least there was some idea of performance targets and whatnot. But the 2070 only offers around 60% of the ray tracing power of the 2080 Ti. So we're kind of left in the dark here about how real life performance is going to shape up. Though Battlefield 5's recommended specs include the 2070, so maybe we'll be okay, but right now we don't know. DLSS though, NVIDIA's extraordinary upscaling technology. Well, we can at least benchmark that and the specs look impressive. And it kind of needs to be impressive because in common with the RTX 2080, standard 3D performance is actually closely matched to the last gen NVIDIA card that's one rung higher on the stack. So the RTX 2080 is very similar in frame rate terms to the 1080 Ti, while the 2070, yeah, as expected, it's close to the 1080. But in other ways, this new 70 series card is very different from its predecessors. It's not a cut down RTX 2080 in the way that the 1070 was a paired back 1080. It's actually based on a whole new chip, TU-106, and this offers around 78% of the CUDA cores of the 2080 and 75% of its ray tracing power. But there are some commonalities between 2070 and 2080 where actually no cutbacks have been made at all. There's still a 256-bit memory interface and both cards deliver a prodigious 448 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. And as you can see from the specs, Turing, well, it still has that CUDA core deficit against Pascal, if we're comparing 2070 to 1080 at least, but the new architecture is considerably more efficient with vastly improved memory caching at the silicon level. So the card we were sent for review is the remarkable MSI Gaming Z8G version of the RTX 2070. It's a bit of a monster in pretty much every single way. Now it's big, it's heavy, has a custom PCB, high quality materials throughout, and an accomplished cooler. The TU-106 chip isn't that much smaller than 1080 Ti's, about 445 square millimeters versus 471, so a good cooling solution is needed, especially when this version of the card comes with a remarkable 210 megahertz factory overclock. More on that in a bit. Ports-wise, we get the same three display ports and HDMI 2.0 as the Founders Edition, plus the USB-C Virtual Link. The FE card only requires one 8-pin power input, but for this one, yup, you guessed it, there's an extra 6-pin input. Even with that big factory OC in place, this RTX 2070 sits below 70 degrees Celsius under load. But whether it's the best 2070 to buy, well, pricing is the thing really, but it's the performance that's more the thing, right? Okay, so for most of my benchmarks, I've detuned the Gaming Z here to Founders Edition clocks to ensure parity with my other Founders Edition benchmarks. And also, as a ton of 2070s on the market do actually come already with some kind of mild OC out of the box. But to begin with, I'm going to take a look at DLSS performance because this is going to be a key Turing technology and the impact could be particularly profound on the RTX 2070. So let's begin with Final Fantasy 15 here with the 2070 stacked up against 1080 and 1080 Ti performance. 
Out of the box, comparing standard TAA rendering, the 2070 already beats the 1080 by an above average 13%. But looking at DLSS, there's a 37% improvement to performance, which in turn offers a 21% boost over GTX 1080 Ti running the same content. In the Epic Infiltrator demo, 2070's apples to apples lead over 1080 extends to a somewhat unlikely 18%, but DLSS adds an additional 42% of performance, giving it a 32% boost over 1080 Ti. Okay, so there may be some shenanigans here with regards to Turing versus Pascal comparisons. But if we're looking at DLSS delivering a 35 to 40% improvement, something we see in both demos, well, the potential here is remarkable. And an important takeaway here is that DLSS boosts are actually pretty uniform across all RTX cards. The 2070 might have a lower spec and fewer of the deep learning tensor cores, but it has the horsepower to run DLSS at full pelt. NVIDIA has accrued plenty of support for DLSS already, which we will be looking at in time. But I do think that these demo numbers are credible. DLSS at 4K essentially works by using deep learning to upscale a 1440p image. And when you think of it like that, the performance boost is pretty much entirely in line with you know, what you should expect. So that's where 2070 could be a real game changer in comparison to 1080 and potentially even 1080 Ti. What is a great performer in the here and now for 1440p gaming is transformed into a card that can handle 4K as well, if not better than 1080 Ti. So let's move on to standard rasterization performance. And here I do feel that 1440p is the baseline resolution you should use this card for like the 1080 before it. So all of my benchmarks are running with an i7 8700K with a 4.7 gigahertz all core turbo, and I've got 16 gigs of 3400 megahertz DDR4. Looking at this benchmark here, stacking up 2070 performance between 1080p, 1440p and 4K resolution, you can see that even with this mighty CPU, there are areas where 1080p and 1440p graph lines get remarkably close and can even bisect. If a 2070 runs at the same frame rate in these areas at 1080p and 1440p, you can reasonably assume that the CPU is your limit here, despite the vast amount of power we've thrown at the problem there. But let's dig into one of my favorite legacy games first of all, Assassin's Creed Unity. It'll set the stage for many of the benches to follow in that the RTX 2070 has a small lead over the 1080. But remember that we are on Founders Edition clocks here, so that six point lead would likely diminish to around half that at reference. The RTX 2080 is 25% faster, while 2080 Ti delivers a mighty extra 50% of performance. Battlefield 1? Yeah, even on a two year old game, the Frostbite engine is still pretty forward looking, so performance is almost 11% better than the 1080. The 2080 offers an 18 point lead, while 2080 Ti continues to dominate with a 45% performance boost. It is interesting to see though, that the 2070 is punching a little over its weight there, eating into the lead of the higher end cards compared to our AC Unity results. Back into legacy territory with another one of my classic benches, Crisis 3. There's a small three point lead over the GTX 1080 here, which vanishes completely at reference clocks. There's an extra 22% of frame rate on the RTX 2080, rising to a phenomenal 55% on 2080 Ti. I mean, if DLSS could work on more games, the 2070's equivalent performance level here would be between those two higher end offerings which really does make you think how much of a game changer DLSS could be if more comprehensively implemented. Next up, the horrific assault on GPU resources that is Ghost Recon Wildland running at ultra settings. A mere six point lead here for the 2070 over 1080. And yeah, once again, reference clocks would halve that lead. I've not plotted the data here, but the 2070 is actually 14% faster than Vega in this bench. RTX 2080 has a 19 point lead over the 2070, which rises to 40% with the mighty 2080 Ti. 
a tale of two Tomb Raiders next, as we study GPU performance on both Rise of the Tomb Raider and its sequel, the recently released Shadow. Both run on Crystal Dynamics Foundation engine, but one tends to slightly favour last-gen Pascal cards, while the other favours Turing. Well, with Rise, once again RTX 2070 offers a tiny perf bump over GTX 1080, which, you guessed it, evaporates if you're on reference clocks. Scaling to RTX 2080 only delivers an extra 16% of performance, which perhaps explains why 1080 Ti can outperform the 2080. But there's a decent 45% boost to performance with the RTX 2080 Ti, which, you know, it's just in a class of its own. So Shadow sees an 11-point lead for the 2070 compared to the 1080. And in turn, the 2080 delivers a 20% uplift in performance over the 2070. 2080 Ti, an extra 50%. Now, as you may have guessed by now, that's fairly indicative of the differentials generally in rasterization performance across the RTX line. And it does demonstrate that the 2070 offers the best frame rate to price ratio. Judged by MSRPs, the RTX 2080 is 40% more expensive than the 2070, but only delivers 20 to 25% more performance. Meanwhile, the 2080 Ti boosts frame rates by around 50%, but has a 100% price premium. Okay, so I'm going to round off the performance numbers with a couple more titles. Yes, we're returning to Novigrad City in The Witcher 3, where founders to founders, RTX 2070 is a remarkable 17% faster than GTX 1080. The 2070 actually seems to be the sweet spot for this title. The 2080 is only 14% faster, while 2080 Ti clocks in with a 43% boost. And for the record, the 2070 is actually 20% faster than Vega 64 here. Remarkable stuff. Finally, Wolfenstein 2, the new Colossus. All of our benchmarks are derived using FCAP a video capture-based benchmarking system that ensures accuracy by actually measuring the frames that come out of the GPU. Unfortunately, artifacts on the border there at lower resolutions stop the monitoring system from working correctly at lower resolutions, meaning we need to do this one at 4K, where the FCAT data remains intact. It's a 10% improvement from 1080 to 2070, but this game actually shines much brighter on the higher-end RTX offerings, kind of like the opposite to The Witcher. There's a straight 30% boost to performance going from 2070 to 2080, and the 2080 Ti is actually 60% faster than the 2070. Right, so I've concentrated on Founders Edition clocks for the most part in this review, but there are some really decent reference cards there at MSRP, like the MSI Armor, for example. And then at the other end, you have cards like the Gaming Z here, which have a monstrous factory overclock. So there's a spectrum of performance across the range of offerings, and this leads to some fascinating results. So in my next set of benchmarks, I've got 1080 and 1080 Ti compared with the 2070 at reference and gaming Z clocks. And doubtless you can see how all of that pans out here. So we've been looking at Crisis 3 here as a legacy title. No real differences between 2070 and 1080 while the Gaming Z offers up an 8-point lead with its mammoth 210MHz factory overclock. GTX 1080 Ti, though, sits pretty at about 16% faster than the Gaming Z. However, if you look at other titles, the situation here becomes a little less clear-cut. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and remember, this does favour Turing hardware, the reference 2070 is 7% faster than the reference 1080, and once again, the Gaming Z's factory overclock gives it an 8-point lead, but the GTX 1080 Ti's lead now drops to around 10%. The Gaming Z can probably stand to overclock a little bit further, and we've not even touched the memory clocks here. On top of that, reviews of the MSI Armor version have seen performance match and slightly exceed the Gaming Z if you manually overclock. So yeah, there's a lot of grey area here for tweakers to explore. Oh, and remember that big Turing boost in The Witcher 3? Well, even at reference clocks, the 2070 has a 13% performance advantage over the 1080, while the Gaming Z factory overclock version of the card offers 96% of the performance of the GTX 1080 Ti, which is 
quite remarkable. The situation is even more fascinating with Battlefield 1, which also has a nice Turing advantage. The reference 2070 has a 7% lead over the 1080, while the Gaming Z version sees the GTX 1080 Ti's dominance reduced to a mere 1.7% lead. I mean, we're approaching margin of error stuff here. So, it's kind of curious really. Certain game engines really like the Turing architecture, and with a range of factory overclocked cards in the market, plus the potential to overclock yourself of course, there's a spectrum of differentials that kind of make pegging down the 2070 in terms of Pascal performance terms just a little bit more challenging. Right then, well let's wrap this up. I don't think RTX 2070 has the immediate impact, the immediate appeal that 1070 and 970 had back in the past. And, you know, let's make no bones about it. The TU-106 chip is bigger, more advanced and costlier to produce. And the memory is more expensive too. And so we are looking at GTX 1080 money for a product that in many situations only offers GTX 1080 performance. Some might say that in rasterization terms, it's a sidestep. And you know what? Well, maybe we should just wait a while just to see how ray trace performance stacks up and to see just how much of a game changer DLSS is gonna be. Personally, I do feel the momentum is there to see these new features being utilized. Maybe at that point, we start to feel some of the 70 line magic arrive with Turing. Okay, so I'm going to wrap things up then. Please do like and subscribe to support the work we do here at Digital Foundry. Ring the bell for instant notifications whenever a new DF video drops. And yeah, do consider the DF Patreon to support the team more directly and to get access to pristine quality video downloads. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this one, if indeed you did. But from me for now, thanks for watching.